So let's um, get to um, a problem that uh, uh, we don't want to have, and that's loss of response or failure to respond. Um, Jorge, do you want to walk us through what are some of the causes of that? What should a clinician be thinking about? Yeah, so, uh, well, you know, we've been talking about the monitoring, and, and, and this is, you know, where, where it becomes critical. You want to identify this, and you want to identify it early. So, you know, the, the, the criteria, I think, they're, they're standard, and, you know, uh, they, I, I think the audience can, can look at these things, and, you know, we, we know that w what it means. Um, and, and there's a difference between not achieving the endpoints that we want, which is what we call, like, primary resistance, and losing the endpoints that you had. So somebody who loses a complete cytogenetic response, that's, that's a secondary resistance. Um, so, so both are important, um, but they may represent a different uh, mechanism. Uh, the mechanism that we understand the best is mutations. Um, we know that, that patients develop uh, able kinase domain mutations, and that is a, a reason for developing resistance. That was kind of the genesis of developing these second generation TKIs that we know can overcome some of these mutations and, you know, and, and they have different profiles of what mutations they, they uh, address and which ones they don't. We even have at least one drug uh, now uh, approved that, that uh, works against the T359, that's pronatinib. Um, so, so we can use that. Now, the problem is that not everybody has a mutation, and um, probably about 50% of the patients has no detectable mutation by the standard Sanger sequencing, which is what most of us get from the clinical labs. Um, some studies have suggested that if you use uh, next generation sequencing and you know, other of the new methodologies, you will identify mutations in a subset of those negative uh, patients um, at very low levels. The question is, is a mutation that's present in 1% of the malignant clone sufficient to, to trigger the resistance uh, or not? Um, and, and, you know, that, that's, the, the, to me, a, an, an open question. Uh, but there's still some patients that don't have mutations. We're starting to understand that some of these patients have a, a disease that's genetically more heterogeneous than we earlier thought. Uh, some patients, uh, particularly um, our colleagues from Australia, uh, Sue Bramford and Tim Hughes, have, have shown that those patients that progress very early, if you go back to the original samples, they have some mutations in some of the genes that are associated with, you know, other leukemias, you know, type 2 mutations and, and ROMS1 mutations and things like that. So it looks like this uh, disease that we thought was very molecularly homogeneous, um, it's not always the case. Um, so we're starting to understand. There's been other things that have been suggested, like the transport of the, the drug into the cell, these, these uh, receptors, the transport, the, the, the SARC. Um, there was a, a story that came as a, originally when, when the satiny was being developed, but it, there's never been a full assessment as to how often that happens. So some of these mechanisms we don't understand. Right now, the one that has clinical value significance is, is the mutations. And so specifically, Mike, how do you... How do you decide when to move on from one able TKI to another based on loss of response or failure to respond? There's, there are some pretty black and white decisions. I mean, if someone doesn't have hematologic response, that's a real problem. That's pretty rare. I think I'm convinced by the fact that someone who doesn't have early molecular response is in trouble. Um, although I think the timing of when you switch is up for, de up for debate. And that's where we get into some of the things we've already talked about. Do you have a real sense for the change over time? How much has the BCR re really reduced? Can we use a 10% milestone? Um, you know, if you've started a patient on a man, for example, why should you be hesitant about using a second generation TKI and switching early? If you, the next patient that came into clinic, you started them on a second generation TKI at the beginning. So I have a fairly low threshold. You know, people waver and, oh, is, is three months, isn't that too early a switch? I'm like, well, uh, you know, and not particularly. Um, it's a kind of a dialogue with the patient. You want to, you know, uh, make sure they understand the risks and, and the benefits, hopefully, of moving forward. But early molecular response failures, again, especially if it's after the mantinib. Um, the second gen initial treatment is a little bit trickier because are you going to abandon that now and go to what? To another second generation drug or to panantinib? Um, so a little bit more thought is required. Uh, and then I think it gets even more subtle when you get to how, how fast did, um, did, does a patient get into major molecular remission or deep molecular remission. I tend to be algorithmic, so I think. You know, I, we set a, set a goal early to say we want to have early molecular mission. We want to have prompt MMR. We'd like to get to deep MR. And 
with the growing length of data on safety and tolerability, although we obviously have some things we have to watch out for, I think switching patients based on guidelines and, and response milestone failures is, is important, with, with the subtleties being that I would lean, lean heavy with EMR, and I would probably be a little bit more watchful waiting with patients in deeper molecular response, especially around MMR or clearly around deep MR. That's, a, that's really an experimental question, you know, to so, optimize. So let me ask you, so a patient is in um, a MMR, okay, what would be a trigger for you to reevaluate that patient, potentially switch therapy? How much of a rise yeah. do you need to see? So loss of MMR, I think, um, is, is important. I think there's data showing that sometimes mutation testing will give you important information, as Jorge just mentioned. That's sort of the one thing we can look at. I'm not sure if it always describes what therapy you should take, but it certainly will guide your therapy choice, because if you see one mutation or another, especially in a dominant clone, that's going to drive your decision. Um, but um, if a patient is, is in MMR and they just you know, maybe plateaus and things like that. Those are different scenarios. But I think loss of MMR is an important threshold to pay attention to. Okay. I'll just, a quick comment about that. Number one, I not always sure that I've changed to somebody who's lost MMR, but, but you know, I, I get the point, but I'll just emphasize confirmed loss of MMR. Yes. No, I, I agree. Not just one time. I agree. Given all the nuances. Okay.